Um, because of the promise of Matthew 16, 18, we do believe, according to Jesus' word, that there has never been a day since the organization of the New Testament church by the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostles in which there was no genuine New Testament church existing on the earth. And so we understand that we believe that. And because of their tie, perhaps, to the Roman Catholicism, we think of the Protestants' view of things is that this, is that the church somehow disappeared in heresy during the Dark Ages. And oftentimes you're going to hear that same type of an idea uh, taught in world history classes as an example when it comes to the history of the church. Uh, but note, however, that we are not from the lineage of Protestants or Reformers, who were the time, uh, at, were part of the time of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the Baptists, though not always called Baptists, and if you notice from the notes and some of the things we mentioned last time, sometimes I put in quotes the name Baptist because we were not always called Baptists along the way. Um, but understand this, um, through the whole church history, we understand that the church has existed since her beginnings in Jerusalem, in Matthew 16, 18. And so let me have a word of prayer with you. I'm going to start to share with you a few things. Again, kind of going through the history of the church very, very, very briefly. I wish we could get into a lot of different things. I mean, I've got notes up a while too, trying to figure out all this stuff uh, when it comes to that. And it just really is enjoyable to be able to see how it is that God has protected and has kept the church moving forward all these years to be able to be where we are today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the word of God, how it reminds us about our biblical foundation. And Lord, then tonight, we understand because of the biblical foundation that we, this evening, have a rich heritage of history that we can look back and see that you began your church and your church has continued to exist for all these years. And tonight we are a continuation of it. Lord, help us to understand our mission. Lord, help us to understand the heart that you have given to us. The desire to be able to multiply. The, the, the need that we have to go out and to preach the gospel to all the world. Where that is the one singular mission that you gave to the church. And we'll continue to do that. If you'll continue to prosper and to help us. Lord, we ask, just ask that you would bless us tonight. Lord, help us to really... Really enjoy this great truth that you have established this church. Here we are 2,000 years later. But we praise you that you continue to bless and to be glorified in your church. Lord, help us to stand on the sure foundation that you built back, back in Matthew 16 18. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of the things I was just mentioning to you went by way of history. Let me uh, encourage you with a couple of things. Of course, many of you know that I like to study and read Spurgeon. In fact, up in my office, I have a lot of Spurgeon books and those kinds of things as well. In fact, one of my sons is even named it in part after him as well. Uh, that way, and I'll let you figure out which one that is. Uh, but Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, I wanted to read a quote to you, and uh, a part of a quote that uh, from a sermon that he had quoted, uh, or he had mentioned. And let me just read this to you. Part of this, I believe, is in your notes there. We believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. Okay, so you kind of look at who we are. We believe this. The Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther or Calvin were ever born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We've always existed from the very days of Christ, and our principles sometimes failed and forgotten, like a river, which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherence. Persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others. Nor, I believe, any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of others under the control of man. We have ever been ready to suffer, as our martyrologies will prove, but we are never but, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with the government, and we will never make the church, although the queen, the despot over the consciences of men. Pretty powerful statement by Spurgeon. We think about who we are. Uh, Spurgeon was a pretty ardent Baptist, and uh, we look at a lot of things that he says, but tonight I'm going to really kind of take you on a journey. It's about 2,000 years worth of journey. Uh, to help you understand a little bit more about our historical foundation. So tonight I want to encourage you to think about this. Discover the Baptist historical foundation. Going back to 
Matthew 16, 18, and we think about that time, about roughly uh, 27 AD. Okay, so we look there. Number one, Roman numeral one in your notes would be this, the primitive church. As you think about the primitive church, about AD 27 to about 600 AD, okay? So again, remember this, we're not in the Old Testament anymore, BC. We're talking about Christ and uh, his ministry on earth, establishing the, um, the ideas we see here in Matthew 16, uh, 18, uh, helping us understand how the church ought to operate, and then continuing on in that primitive time to about uh, the year 600. So we begin looking at church history as Jesus comes on the scene to take with him 12 chosen men. In fact, there's a great book uh, named that. We encourage you if you want to study the 12 apostles. It's a great study. Uh, but this, they were disciples who would be his apostles. For about three to four years, Jesus poured his life into these men who would be the leaders of his early church. Okay, anybody want to stand up and name all of the twelve apostles? By the way, their wives are not the epistles. Just in case you were wondering. No, okay. okay, but uh, uh, when it comes to that, let me encourage you to go back and kind of think about the names of those guys. Uh, some of them have the same names, by the way. But the days of the church were exciting as preaching continues and scores of people were one. And they were added to the church. Can you imagine being a part of the church where like 3,000 people get saved, 5,000 people? You know, it's like, can you imagine having a baptismal service? Man, getting all those people out there and baptizing. How many of you think your shoulders and your arms might be a little sore after a day like that? You know, uh, that'd be a pretty cool day, though. I'm sure they split it up and they had different people doing that. Uh, the whites, I think I told you uh, about the whites over in Togo when they were over there. Uh, they would have one person... Uh, out in the water baptizing, and then they have the couple, uh, another person helping the person from the land get out to the water, and then they have one or two people out there uh, with guns to be able to shoot the crocodiles, right? And so it's just a different way of living. I guess uh, here in Louisiana we can kind of relate to that uh, a little bit, um, but it is just a different way of living. Uh, but baptism is important. So the early church met in the early days of, at Solomon's porch of the temple, according to Acts 5 12. They also met in homes of people. Uh, shown to us several different places, including Acts 12, 12. But then persecution because of the preaching of the gospel started, and Christ's followers began to give their lives. The Christians continued to take the gospel with them as they fled the persecution. Now, this is an important thing. We remember that Jesus gave to the uh, disciples, to the early church, the commission to go out and to preach the gospel everywhere they went. Well, this was the problem. They stayed in Jerusalem. But that allowed persecution. When the persecution started, guess what started happening? They started to leave Jerusalem, and guess what? As they left, they carried with them the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Acts 8, 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere to whittling their tongues. Yeah. The Bible says as they went, they were scattered abroad, and they went preaching the word. Right? It's like, oh, man. They didn't, they didn't go ahead and just go start complaining. I had to leave Jerusalem. I leave up my life, leave in there. No, no, no. Everywhere they went, they were still thankful for the opportunity to be able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ despite the persecution that they were facing. The book of Acts centers on Jerusalem and then Antioch, then as the center of church activity. And it was during the book of Acts that Christ's followers were first given the name, what? Do you remember? Christian. They were first given the name of Christian at the city of Antioch. And that name stuck. Acts 11, 26, when they had found him, they brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, understand this, they didn't call themselves Christians. That was a name that was given to them. Now, let me remind you, too, that name Baptist that we have was a name that was given to us. It wasn't what we We'll call ourselves the Baptists, okay? Uh, it was a name given. It's the same idea when it comes to being a, a Christian. Christian literally means little Christ. In many ways, it was used as a derogatory way. Oh, there goes a little Jesus. That's kind of the idea. And so it was kind of a, a name to pick on these Christ-like people. But we can carry as a badge in many ways today, amen? But the Apostle Paul went on several missionary journeys, preaching the gospel, planting churches throughout the Roman Empire, and ultimately the gospel reached Rome, which was... The, the desires of the Apostle Paul. Romans 1.15, he says this, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. After Paul died, according to tradition, he was beheaded. And from that point until the death of John the Apostle, 
which is about between AD 68 to AD uh, 100, is the time frame we know least about the early church. We know that the destruction of Jerusalem was about AD 70, and it created great changes for the Jews and the church alike. You can remember, as the church is growing, there's still sacrifices and things going on in the temple until AD 70. So when the temple is destroyed, now we can start to see that there's some changes amongst Judaism in Jerusalem as well. So the Jewish tithe of the church started to disintegrate more rapidly afterward. Remember, the Apostle Paul, when he would go to the, on his missionary journeys or go to different places, he would seek what? He would go find a synagogue, and he would tell the story of Jesus there, how Jesus is a fulfillment of prophecy from the Old Testament. But when the temple was destroyed, we start to see that this connection between Christianity and Judaism, it starts to disintegrate even faster over that period of time. This time also is a time when we have the very first second generations of Christians who are coming on the scene. Think about that. We start to look at some of the people who were saved in the early church. 5,000 get saved, 3,000 get saved. And then we start to see second generations of people who they continue to grow. And they start to have questions. Their churches are flourishing. Before John the Apostle ever died, he had warned the church of heresies that were waiting on the doorsteps that had already begun to influence portions of the church, wherever the church was. He said this in 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already, it is in the world. There were people who were going to some of these churches and they were proclaiming that Jesus Christ was not God, if you will. He was not God come in the flesh. The church has never been a perfect church, right? You know how I know that? Because I look in the mirror in the morning and I know I'm part of the church. Okay? You do the same thing. The church is not perfect because we are not perfect. Uh, how many of you have ever talked to a good Christian and you disagree with them on some theological detail along the way? Right? There are some things in the Word of God that uh, sometimes we have questions about that. But when it comes to understanding clear doctrine of the Word of God, we cannot differ on those things. Okay? But when it comes to, example, the same Hebrew used to try to figure out how many angels can fit on the head of a needle. I mean, that's kind of crazy stuff, right? We really need to debate about those kinds of things. When it comes to the word of God, we understand the church has never been perfect. And the persecution from without did affect the church. And the heresy and fighting from within would soon take its toll on the church. So there was fighting, there was, there was persecution from without, but there was also problems. And there was also a heresy that was trying to be introduced with inside the church. The, the church at Corinth apparently made some good strides, but then never really got over her politicking. We think about this, Nero at first seemed to tolerate the Christians, but then turned against them. Domitian ordered Christians to be persecuted. John the Apostle was banished to Patmos during Domitian's reign. We think about some of these things. We think about the primitive church. Go to the next screen there. I think uh, uh, you'll see that there's a, a timeline up here. And it's a little hard to see from where you are. This is a time frame we're living in. Inside that box there, the first 600 years. Now, the bottom of the screen there, um, which, by the way, on the back side of your sheet, there's a timeline. And if you want a bigger copy of some of these things, there's some available along the way there. But sometimes you guys complain I give you like full sheets, so I figured it's done with it. Uh, as far as, there's a, a lot of neat things to be able to see there. But we're looking at this early time, uh, the far left-hand side of this timeline, uh, AD 26 to about AD 600. There's a lot of things that are going on uh, with the early church. Uh, and so we're still, right now we're talking about the very left-hand side of the screen. So we think about the very, very early part of the church. We think about uh, Domitian ordered Christians to be persecuted. John the Apostle was banished to Patmos during Domitian's reign. Okay, it's one of the Caesars of the emperors. Uh, the Apostle Paul may have taken the gospel to Spain and perhaps even as far as to France, Germany, and England. We can't verify that completely, but we do know that the gospel eventually did get there. The apostles carried the gospel uh, throughout the known world, and all but John the Apostle died as martyrs, except for one of the Jews is scared to hung himself, right? We remember that. So Clement, when we think about some of the early church fathers, there were the first generation of leaders to follow the apostles. You may have heard that expression, the early church fathers. And uh, one of those was Clement. Uh, 
which, by the way, Clement, we don't know. We, there's a possibility he may have been mentioned in Philippians 4.3, uh, where the Apostle Paul writes, And I treat thee also through your fellow. Help those women which labor with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Um, this person, Clement, one of the early church fathers, knew Paul, Peter, and John, and he wrote a letter to the church of Corinth to handle a dispute that was in the church. So now we're starting to step outside, okay? These are things that are not recorded in Scripture. But we know that there's history there, so we're trying to look at some of the history between okay, the book of Revelation until where we are today. Okay, so we're kind of uh, taking that leap out of the Bible and looking at uh, uh, history. Polycarp was a pupil of John the Apostle and bishop of the church of Smyrna. So how many of you wish you could really like spend time with John the Apostle? Be cool. Well, this guy did, and he was one of the early church fathers, and when it came to being a pastor, guess what? He was a bishop of the church of Smyrna, which, by the way, sometimes when you hear that term bishop, doesn't that sound kind of Catholic? But think about this. In the Word of God, one of the words that we see in Scripture for a pastor is not just a shepherd, if you will, but the idea of a bishop. And so, frankly, it is actually an interchangeable word. Now, I'm not asking you to say this, but technically you could say, I am the bishop of Oakland Way Baptist Church. Okay. I don't recommend that you do that because it might sound weird to people, right? Uh, but I have been called weird things, by the way, uh, since living here. But uh, Ignatius was also a pupil of John the Apostle. Uh, Papias was another disciple of John the Apostle and was an ardent Chileist. You say, what in the world is a Chileist? A premillennialist. Okay, so he believed in that. Uh, premillennialism. All the early church fathers, those who knew the apostles, agreed that baptism was to follow salvation, was to never be administered to infants. So there's a doctrinal stance that the early church fathers had. From this time, though, the second in the second century, the church experienced great suffering or bitter public resentment against them at the hands of some of the Roman emperors. And on that chart there, it's kind of hard to see the bottom side there. Uh, some of the Roman emperors, Trajan. You would remember these names from history class, right? Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, some of their Commodus, and Septimus Severus. And some of the church allowed the introduction of classes to evolve, such as clergy and laity. Okay, so if you will, if we were to follow the same line, which we do not, um, but I am a pastor, so I would be clergy. Most of you are laity. Okay, so they started to break out different classes. I am of a holy class, and you are not done. That's what they would say. I don't believe that, okay? Uh, but they started to build these different classes that they had into the church, and it continued from there. This allowed the way to pave the way later for priests and other classes such as bishops and archbishops and those kind of things. Some also started to confuse baptism with salvation. Okay, when it came to doctrinal positions, there started to be some changes along the way. And so they started to confuse, well, baptism, how does that work? Maybe baptism saves people. And so they started to interject that. Some did. So early in the second century, the books of the New Testament canon were formed by a universal acceptance by the churches. The rise of the Anabaptists is a term given to those Christians who refused baptisms from false churches and those who have been born as infants. So there were some who started to baptize children where they started to think, well, if, if water baptism somehow can save a person, then let's start baptizing them earlier. So that's where the idea of an Anabaptist came in. Anna means re, okay, or to do it again. So a rebaptizer. So this was a name given to the Anabaptists in this sense. So suppose you were born. Okay, here's an example. When I was little, I grew up in Lutheran church. I was sprinkled as a baby. Okay, so then when we got saved, we went to the Baptist church, and guess what? They rebaptized us. Now that's the idea of a rebaptizer because if you were sprinkled or poured or baptized when you were a baby, then you got rebaptized. The people who do the rebaptizing were the Anabaptists, Anabaptists, the name given to them. Okay, now they didn't believe that they were Anabaptists; they believed that they were actually baptizing people for the first time. Okay, so they understand that there's a difference, but that was a name given to that group of people who did start to, in their minds, publicly, they thought that these people were the rebaptizers. And they baptize people from false churches and those who have been born uh, or uh, have been baptized as infants. So, there are many groups that we identify as holding the same beliefs as the early church and Baptists of today. Okay, so you're going to start to see, in fact, some of them are up in the chart up there. And I'm going to mention some of those to you in just a second. A few of them. We 
you start to see them up there, some of the big names in there. I'm going to mention three of them to you, but there's several others that are scattered up there. They practice the, we think about um, when it comes to the church, here's a quote, uh, another quote from Spurgeon. Spurgeon reminds us of this. He says, history has hitherto been written by our enemies. Okay, we have to understand, what we know mostly of the Baptists early on, what we call Baptists, is what was written about them by their enemies. Okay? So a lot of the documents that they had written about each other, to each other, that later they were destroyed uh, during the times of persecution. And of course, that was a long time ago, too. And so most of those things did not survive. But we understand the things that were kept or were written about us, we have our history written to us by their enemies, who never would have kept a single fact about us upon the record if they could have helped it. And yet it leaks out every now and then that certain poor people called Anabaptists were brought up for condemnation. From the days of Henry II to those of Elizabeth, we hear a certain unhappy heretics who were hated of all men for the truth's sake, which was in them. We, we read of poor men and women with their garments cut short, turned out of the fields to perish in the cold, and anon of others who were burnt in Newington for the crime of Anabaptism. Long before your Protestants were known of, these horrible Anabaptists, as they were unjustly called, were protesting for the one Lord, one faith, one baptism. No sooner did the visible church begin to depart from the gospel than these men arose to keep fast by the good old way. The priests and monks wished for peace and slumber, but there was always a Baptist or a Wilder tickling men's ears with the Holy Scriptures and calling their attention to the errors of the time. They were a poor, persecuted tribe. The halter was thought to be too good for them. At times, no written history would have us think that they died out. So well had the wolf done his work on the sheep. Yet here we are, blessed and multiplied, and Newington sees other scenes from Sabbath to Sabbath. As I think of your numbers and efforts, I can only say and wonder what a group. As I think of the multitudes of our brethren in America, I may well say, what hath God wrought? Our history forbids discouragement. We think about where we are today. And uh, we see that God has done a great thing for us by preserving this great history for us. So the doctrine of baptism then has historically been very important to the Baptist, hence our name. About AD 150, as some churches began to drift to a united church in Rome uh, to build churches, uh, to build classes, and to confuse, confuse baptism with salvation, we can see some different groups were born. Of these, first of all, there in your notes is this, the Montanists, the Montanists, M-O-N-T-A-N. STS, so the Montanists. We think about the Montanists, and they were led by a man named Montanus, okay? And uh, Montanus sought to restore Christianity to its native simplicity. In fact, the Word of God reminds us about that. We're not supposed to forget the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. Montanism began in central Phrygia, which is in Asia Minor, and then quickly spread to Europe and to Africa. So the gospel continued to spread in different parts of the world. The practice of purity of communion and rebaptizing those who came from establishment churches, i.e., the Roman Catholic Church. They baptized by immersion, practiced living a holy life, exercised strict church discipline, believed in the Trinity, believed in pre premillennial eschatology, and held to the complete word of God. And by the way, a lot of those things sound a lot like Baptists today. We think of another group, and I'll mention those to you, that's the Novatians. The Novatians. And um, uh, the Novatians followed the Montanists in the third century. And the third century saw bigger changes for established churches. The rise of classes stretched further, with various ecclesiastical or clergy classes added to the Roman Catholic Church. Oriental mysticism filled churches with weird teachings like required fastings. The sign of the cross was initiated, and later the practice of infant baptism was introduced. Although, initially, not as widely practiced as some people think, in the beginnings of the quote-unquote mass were seen. Were, were seen. Uh, Novation sought to keep their churches clear of heresy <coughs> and followed a, a very strict form of church discipline. So the Novations and the Montanists rebaptized people from dissident churches, hence they were called Anabaptists, or the rebaptizers. In France, the Novations were called by a different name, the Cathari, which means this, the fewer ones, and they would also later be called what's called the Waldensi, and uh, so you'll see that name pop up as well. Let me give you the name of a third group, and this is the Donatists. The Donatists. The 
Donatists arrived in the 4th century, and they too believed that salvation was a pre-qualification for membership in the church. Their coming, their coming came as they fought the establishment of the state church. And looking at history, you may remember Constantine. Remember who Constantine was? He was the Roman, uh, sorry, he was the Roman emperor who basically he saw the, the blazing cross in the sky and the word that said, by this sign conquer. And so Constantine uh, saw this as an opportunity to save the Roman Empire and to marry it to a state religion, the religion of Christianity. And so he did that. And so the Donatists believed that it was not right for the state to persecute on behalf of the church. Kind of makes sense. As Christians, we don't believe that. Baptists, we don't. Uh, but we can see when they married the state, the government, with a faith of Christianity, the Donatists fought against that idea of thinking that hey, the government should persecute people for their faith, if you will. So at first, the Donatists appealed to Constantine, but Constantine ordered them to be suppressed, which ignited the Donatists' passion to create a movement that covered the whole of North Africa until later when the Muslims invaded. The Donatists were also called Anabaptists and Puritans. You hear Puritans. Their basic foundations coming about because of the Donatists, and their teaching spread to Italy and Spain by the end of the fourth century. So, the fifth century then saw the rise of the papacy, the papacy and the monastic living, and eventually the Roman Empire faded to the background of history as the Pope filled the power vacuum of warring between the East and the West. All of the groups mentioned earlier had some churches flourishing in many locations, some even in Rome. So, during this time, Christians in Britain seem to stay away from many of the negatively influenced uh, influences of established religion. And as Rome fell and troops left, the British Christians were driven back as the Saxons invaded England and overthrew Christianity by burning churches and driving the Christians into Cambria, which is now Wales. And so you'll be familiar with Wales and either uh, England and Wales. These Welsh churches became the Welsh Baptists. Eventually, we hear about the Welsh revivals and those kinds of things as well. Okay, so now think about this. I'm going to show you another picture. Does anybody know who this is? Anybody know who that is? Is there anyone who's holding his hand? We're coming up close to the month of March. About this period of time, uh, when it comes to history, Patrick. Everybody say Patrick. Okay, Patrick took the gospel to Ireland. 387, Patrick was born, and his father was probably. A Baptist deacon. Interestingly, very interestingly, the Catholics claimed him as one of their heroes, but in fact, most likely a Baptist hero. A Baptist deacon, we see in 403, Patrick was kidnapped and taken into slavery in Ireland. In 410, Patrick escaped from Ireland and returned home. And then in 432, he forgave his captors and returned to Ireland as a missionary with 12 other people. And many were converted and baptized under his ministry, and then he died in 465. This kind of brief history of Patrick, but we start to think about uh, what was going on during this period of time. This is kind of the, the primitive time of the church, okay? So primitive church history. Let me kind of take a step into the next area, 600 to 1500. 600 to 1500. This is the period of time that we call the medieval church. Let me just show you a chart about the medieval church, M-E-D-I-E-V-A-L, okay? So the medieval church, and when we think about the medieval church, you can see the timeline shifts. This is between the time period of 600 to 1500. It's roughly a time period of about a thousand years. Okay, so this, because it was about a thousand years, some people have called it the Devil's Millennium. Uh, other people have called it the Dark Ages. <coughs> right? You've heard that before along the way. During this period of time, um, unless you are part of the ecclesiastical class, you were not encouraged necessarily to. Or the noble class, you did not really learn a whole lot. Bibles were chained to pulpits. Uh, you were forbidden to read the Bible. There's a lot of things that happened under the uh, Roman control. Uh, so during the Dark Ages, it began as the changes were seen in the preceding centuries. They settled into the apostate church. Okay, so this is where the apostate church was strongly in control. The Roman church was fully formed and fully empowered. Why? Because she was not just ecclesiastical, but she also had rule in the state or the control of the, of the government. Okay, So we can see that she had a lot of power. Uh, doing this during this time, though, true true Christians did continue to exist. Okay, so sometimes we think and look at history and think, where were all the Christians? What was going on? Well, they were suppressed. Okay, during the period of persecution, you think about all the inquisitions and stuff. Which some of those things uh, are shown up here. Um, 
as well. When you start to see the inquisitions, and by the way, they're also showed on the, the chart that you have in the back of your notes uh, too. Uh, but during this time, uh, true Christians did exist and they did spread. And a case in point for this is that during the medieval period, think about this. I think this is up here. This is in your notes. The Roman Catholic Church persecuted dissenting believers, most of which were issues relating to the doctrinal position of baptism. You know why? In a large part, Christianity is believed Jesus, right? Who he is. Uh, Roman Catholicism believes in the Trinity like we believe in the Trinity. There's a lot of ideas uh, that uh, true Christianity and Roman Catholicism share. But one of the things that uh, angered the Roman Catholics and when it came to their stance and their position on doctrine is when the Anabaptists came along and they said, hold on a second, you have to be saved, to be a part of the church, and then you have to get rebaptized. And now you're getting baptized outside of the institution that everybody else is going to. And so the Roman Catholic Church did not like that, and hence it was also taken care of uh, by positions of leadership. The Protestant Church later would claim the true that true Christianity had perhaps ceased to exist, and that they revived it. But that is simply not the case. So during the medieval period, during this dark time, if you will, a lot of people think, or the reformers or the Protestants would say, no, no, no. What happened is Christianity pretty much died, and we revived it during the Protestant period. Hold on a second. Let me remind you, during this period, remember all those, those three groups we were just talking about? They were still there. They were still preaching the gospel. Sometimes they were suppressed. They were in different parts of the world. They were spread out all, uh, all kinds of different locations, but they were still preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So we look here at the medieval church. Now, of course, we call it the medieval church because in general, when it comes to general church history and following a lot of what's going on in the world history, this was the period that we understand as medieval or the dark ages. Roman numeral three. We step out of that into what we call the modern church. You're like, oh, that's where we are. Okay? So here we are. This is where we are living. This is from AD 1500 to where we are today. We are currently living in the, in the modern church age. Okay, hold on a second. Doesn't that go like back to Martin Luther and those kinds of things? Yep. We go back a long way. And we start to think about this history. The Protestant Reformation began historically when what? You remember what happened? Here's a little clue. Let me put this in. Right? Okay, here we go. 95 pieces nailed on the doors of the Church of Wittenberg, Germany. Right? And uh, so he did that. And when that happened, we can see that a great Reformation started out. Although free reformers set in motion. Reformation, such as, remember, John Wycliffe, a few days before this. Uh, he, by the way, believes in the absolute authority of Scripture, and so he translated the Bible from the Latin Vulgate. Saying, why did he do that? Why did he translate it from Latin? Because he didn't know Hebrew and Greek. So he did the best thing he knew how to do. So he got the Latin Bible, and he translated it. And he translated it into Middle English. Think about this, John Huss. I remember who John Huss was. He started what we know today as the Moravian Church, which is still around, if you happen to go to Allentown, Pennsylvania and visit my family, you go across the way. There's a town called Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And guess what's there? An establishment of Moravians. And they have a big star up there for Bethlehem. It's a fun place to go at Christmas time. Um, but uh, when you go there, there's an establishment. Of, there's a Moravian school there. There's a Moravian church there. It's pretty cool. I'd be able to go up that way. Um, but John Huss started that just before the Reformation. And uh, we think the Moravians denounced the Pope. In fact, they called him the Antichrist. That kind of got them in trouble, right? And so 1537, we look here about this time, and Menno Simons, say, who in the world was Menno Simons? He was, became the leader of the Dutch Anabaptist, and he was a pacifist, but was a leading figure in the Radical Reformation, which is a pretty much, uh, was a pretty much Anabaptist-dominated reaction to the Protestant Cato Baptist reformers like Luther, Lingley, and Calvin. You say, what in the world is a Cato Baptist? You might want to write that word down. A Cato Baptist is somebody who believes in baptizing babies. Okay, so think about this. Remember, Martin Luther broke away from the Roman Catholic Church by quoting what verse? Romans 1 20, I think, that says, The just shall live by faith, right? That's what caused him to break away from the Roman Catholic Church because he's like, Hey, hold on a second. We're supposed to be trusting Christ by faith, not by our works. But all of a sudden, a little bit later on, he started to kind of pull back into Roman Catholicism. Like he started saying, hey, maybe, maybe we should get baptized. So 
Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin. Uh, we think they kind of started pulling some of their ideas. Um, they kind of retained too much of Catholicism. They started to retain some things in part, such as Mary worship. Uh, and generally speaking, the Protestants hated the Anabaptists, sometimes violently so. So very interestingly, even though some of the Protestants became much more like the Baptists, and they pulled away from Roman Catholicism, guess what they did? They also persecuted the Baptists, just like the Catholics did. And so very interestingly, uh, they did this. So what happened? Meadow Simons. Uh, However, uh, we think that what he did admirably, he maintained his pacifist position and he refused to become involved in physical violence. In 1543, he went as a missionary from Netherlands to Germany, and Menno Simons is the father, or if you will, the founder of what we call the Mennonites. You ever met a Mennonite? I used to go to school with a lot of Mennonites uh, up in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of Mennonites and Amish, okay, similar uh, when it comes to that. So the Mennonites, the Amish, guess what? I tread on some of those types of things tonight. I don't have time for that. Okay, the Anabaptists became the Baptists, and we'll kind of come on from there. By observing the course of history and looking into the Word of God, we can know that the line of true Christian churches cannot be broken. Matthew 16, 18, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Catch that? God's going to continue to build this church. There will always be a church preaching the Word of God until Jesus comes. Catch that? So if we learn that in Scripture, it cannot be broken. So the church did not like start and die and dissolve and then start over again. You know, there always has been a preaching church. So I want to share a few quotes with you. Did you enjoy that last week? I showed you I shared a few quotes with you. I'm going to end with a few quotes. Okay, here's the first one. The Edinburgh Encyclopedia. You say, well, what the world is that? It's a, it's a Presbyterian publication. Here's what the Presbyterian said of this. Okay? They said this. It speaks of Tertullian who lived just 50 years after the death of the Apostle John. Here's what they said. It must have already occurred to our readers that the Baptists are the same sect of Christians that were formerly described as Anabaptists. Indeed, this seems to have been their leading principle from the time of who? Tertullian to the present time. Ooh, when did he live? 50 years after the Apostle John. That goes back a long ways. Can I read another quote to you? Here's a couple pages long on the screen here. Doctors, I don't know how to say his name. I think it's A, the page, something like that. J.J. Dermount, they received a royal commission from the King of Holland to prepare the history of the Dutch Reformed Church in 1819. Here's what they wrote. Which, by the way, under royal sanction and officially published, it contains this testimony inside of it. You can see that here on the screen. We have now seen that the Baptists, who were formerly called Anabaptists, were the original. Waldensies, which I mentioned to you earlier, on this account, the Baptists may be considered as the only religious community which has stood since the days of the apostles, and as a Christian society which has preserved pure the doctrines of the gospel through all ages. The perfectly correct external and internal economy of the Baptist denomination tends to confirm the truth, disputed by who? the Rumish Church. That the Reformation brought about in the 16th century was in the highest degree necessary, and at the same time goes to refute erroneous notion of the Catholics that their denomination is the most ancient. Wow. Not said by a Baptist, said by a Reformer. When it comes to being a Baptist, do not shy away from the truth of your forefathers. Can I read and break the whistle just a little bit more? Ever thought about this? How many of you know who John Gano is? Raise your hand that way. Let's go to modern church history. I should have put a picture up here. I didn't. Our first president, what was his name, by the way? George Washington. Do you know there's even a story that was told in Time magazine? September the 5th, 1932. And it's entitled this Religion, Washington's Baptism. We think about this. That John, that, uh, John Gano baptized his friend as a Baptist chaplain, John Gano, he baptized George Washington in the famous river there by Valley Forge after the Revolutionary War. Very interesting. Now, if we think about America, if we think about our roots even today, where we are, we have a rich history as Baptists. Now, I know. Most of the time in our world, guess what? We're considered to be 
persecuted. You think about America, we talk about sometimes we, we kind of grow in numbers. We're very, very blessed in America. We have seen unprecedented blessing by God in America. But when it comes to our rich history, remember that we have a rich history that extends all the way back to the very days of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is still our head. And as long as we keep him there, he will be our leader. So tonight, knowing our foundation, what we're going to begin to uncover next time, we'll begin to look at the doctrines and beliefs of Baptists that we've held way back then, and the doctrines and beliefs that we still hold even today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to serve you, to be able to stand for you, to be able to live for you in our church. We thank you for the truth of the word of God, how it reminds us that you are going to have a preaching church that will continue to proclaim the gospel for all times and eternity. Lord, help us to be that church. Lord, help us to stand for you and to understand that we are Christians because we have taken a stand for you. We think about our name, the, the rich heritage as far as being a Baptist because people have called us Baptist, if you will. Lord, help us to continue to stand for you. And we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Please help us to continue to do that because of the great biblical foundation and the great historical foundation that you have blessed us with. Dismiss us with your blessing. Help us to come back ready to worship you this coming Sunday as we continue to proclaim the gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a great night. If you have any questions, please let me know. And we'll see you all very, very soon. God bless you.